It's time for a little foreplay on Game Boy Works. Yes, yes, that was a bad and embarrassing and hackneyed pun, but just you try and come up with witticisms about Game Boy games every single week. And anyway, I have no regrets because it gets right to the heart of what makes this week's entry so remarkable. A few episodes back, we looked at Trump Boy 2, and my primary takeaway from that game was, why bother? But that wasn't entirely fair to pack in video, because Trump Boy 2 did offer one significant advantage over its predecessor, support for the Game Boy 4-player adapter. I didn't really address the 4-player adapter in that episode, though, because it properly belongs with this week's game, F1 Race by Nintendo. This video series has drifted very slightly from strict chronological order for logistical reasons, which wouldn't normally be a big deal, but it did result in the slight hiccup of Trump Boy 2 appearing before the game whose pack and peripheral it took advantage of. Uh, well, sort of. In the US, F1 Race for Game Boy shipped in an oversized box that contained both the game and the four-player adapter peripheral. But, well, that was America, where Nintendo recognized the innate stinginess of the native market and frequently offered pack-in values for items that were sold separately back in Japan. When F1 Race debuted in Japan, it shipped as a standalone title, and the four-player adapter appeared packaged separately. On its Japanese launch on November 9, 1990, those two games supported the adapter, F1 Race and Trump Boy 2. And you know, playing Trump Boy 2's mediocre card games with other people really does make them slightly more enjoyable, or at the very least, less stacked against the player. The real question, I suppose, is how did Pack and Video, of all companies, somehow manage to finagle its way into being on hand for the debut of a first party Game Boy accessory? That seems like the kind of distinction Nintendo would reserve for a top tier partner, not a C tier studio like Pack and Video. Then again, it's not like the four player adapter is precisely one of Nintendo's most meticulously guarded and documented creations. Indeed, I've been unable to find a comprehensive listing online of games that support the device. The closest thing out there is Wikipedia's list, and I had to add Trump Boy 2 to that myself. Similarly, there's little information online about the origins of the device or even how it works. It's fallen to enthusiasts to puzzle out and document the workings of the four-player adapter. It's a strange little device, really. The Game Boy shipped with support for two-player linking right out of the box, but it was never really intended to allow for larger matches than that. Compare that to Atari's Lynx, whose Comlinx connection was specifically designed to daisy chain. Each Comlinx cable included a branching female input jack that split off from the two male plugs on either end. If you wanted to link up more than two Lynxes, all you needed to do was simply tap into an existing Comlinx connection through that branching jack, and yet another player could then join in by tapping into your cable's jack. The Comlinx protocol could actually support as many as 16 devices before overloading the available data bandwidth, and at least 15 games for the system supported more than two players. Todd's Adventure in Slime World represented Lynx's most connected title, topping out at 8. Game Boy ultimately saw about the same number of 4-player titles, despite having something like 20 times as many overall releases as Lynx, and only one game, Baseball 2000, could theoretically support more than 4 people. I say theoretically because support for 16 people has been found in that game's code, but the Game Boy 4-player adapter doesn't support Daisy Team. Unlike Comlinx, the 4-player adapter operates with a hub format. The adapter itself plugs into one Game Boy, and then up to three other systems plug into the adapter. There is a sequential element of the four-player adapter as each port is numbered, and the built-in connection always connects to player one. But according to the Edge of Emulation series by a writer named Shonumi, the four-player adapter runs its own internal software that works as a traffic cop of sorts for multiplayer data. This was probably necessary due to the fact that the link cable in itself is a bit of a hack that almost shouldn't even work to begin with. But it does make things difficult if you want to, say, put together a 16-player Faceball 2000 match, since the hub setup doesn't actually daisy-chain, as a large group of people recently learned at Midwest Gaming Classic. I recently spoke to Takehiro Izushi, a former member of Nintendo R&D 1 who worked on numerous Game Boy projects, and he confirmed that the four-player adapter was an internally developed Nintendo device. He said he's fairly certain it was designed by none other than Satoru Okada, the lead hardware designer for the Game Boy which suggests to me that enabling four-player communication on Game Boy was such a daunting technical challenge that only the console's creator was up to the task. In any case, the four-player adapter suffers from a few other limitations as well. Perhaps most notably, its player one connection is hardwired into the device, 
which means that in order to use the adapter at all, you need to use an original Game Boy hardware model as your lead system. Later hardware revisions, beginning with Game Boy Pocket, sported more compact link cable ports. While cross-device cables exist that allow you to connect a Game Boy with a Game Boy Pocket or Game Boy Color or Game Boy Advance, the four-player adapter has to connect to a system capable of accepting an original model link cable plug. In short, the four-player adapter is an odd, clumsy, limited device supported by few games. But it's worth remembering just how much trouble the idea of handheld multiplayer used to be in this day and age where connecting multiple people on the go is as simple as a Wi-Fi handshake or swapping some Joy-Cons. We've come a long way. As for the game design for use with the adapter, well, it's somewhat interesting if not precisely surprising. F1 Race is easily the most impressive racing game we've yet seen for Game Boy, though that's admittedly a low bar to clear. Given its straightforward title, this may have been intended as a portable follow-up to the 1984 Famicom Racer by the same name. We've already seen a few cases where Nintendo created portable sequels to its console titles, most notably Balloon Kid, and this would seem to continue that trend. And this follows the same pattern as those other titles. It uses a similar presentation format and similar mechanics to the previous game while adding quite a bit to it. F1 Race for Famicom was pretty bare bones as a racing game, more or less amounting to a pole position clone. And that was fine for 1984, really. It was enough that F1 Race managed to create 3D graphics with a behind-the-car perspective and a road vanishing into the horizon. That was honestly more than the Famicom seemed capable of doing right out of the box, and the novelty went a long way at the time. In fact, it was enough of a technical feat that Nintendo wasn't able to create the game internally. Instead, they had to summon the legendary Satoru Iwata to program its immersive point of view. By the time this Game Boy sequel rolled around, the company seemed to have a better handle on its own hardware. F1 Race was created internally at Nintendo R&D 1 by a team of plucky youngsters like Masahiko Mashimo and Naotaka Onishi. Their names haven't precisely become household names, but they're all still with Nintendo and have worked on an impressive array of beloved franchises, ranging from Fire Emblem to WarioWare to Paper Mario. This is the work of a core Nintendo team, and the quality shows. F1 Race is also notably the debut title for a composer by the name of Kazumi Totaka, the inspiration behind K.K. Slider in Animal Crossing. While his trademark melody doesn't seem to appear here, F1 Race does have a rocking soundtrack, unfortunately is mostly drowned out by the whine of the player's engine. Still, you can see his artful touch in the music here. You begin each race in silence, but for the squeal of tires and hum of engines. It's only after about 10 seconds into each race that the music kicks in. It's an unusual way to present the soundtrack to a racing game, a genre where you're meant to feel like you're blasting at full speed at all moments, but it works. This being a Formula One racing title, there's nothing really surprising about F1 Race. You go as fast as possible as you jockey against other racers for the pole position. There are no road hazards to worry about, no weapons to dodge, no crazy bursts of speed boosting. It's just you, a bunch of generic other racers, and the need to move left and right a lot. If there's any surprise to F1 Race, it's just how demanding the Grand Prix mode is. Seriously, this game demands absolute perfection in order to advance. You have to come in first place in order to reach the next track. I guess that's one way to stretch playtime out of a game with only 8 tracks, but it feels weirdly onerous. Like, you have to play perfectly from the very beginning in order to see anything beyond the first track. As someone with no particular aptitude for racing games, I'm not extremely in love with this concept, especially since nearly every other racer I've ever played allows you to advance so long as you rake in like the top 3. Of course, it's perfectly possible to see the rest of the game's racetracks, just not in Grand Prix mode. You can hop over to Time Trial mode and select from any of the 8 courses, which vary in difficulty from the extremely straightforward opening track to the alarmingly convoluted India course. While you don't earn any progression by playing Time Trial, it does at least allow you to check out the sights. 
Alternately, if you're not having any luck against the CPU, you can always play head-to-head -head against as many as three other people. The multiplayer mode doesn't sacrifice any of the game's innate speed in order to accommodate the other racers, which is impressive. You also still get music, unlike four-player competition in Mario Kart 64. Setting up a multiplayer match is surprisingly painless once you get everyone connected. The game creates a sort of multiplayer lobby that instantly detects when other copies of the game connect to the four-player adapter and enter multiplayer mode. Every racer enters their name and engine type, while player one gets to pick the track selection and the number of races to complete. It's simple and to the point, but it works. While F1 Race won't precisely blow anyone's mind with its mechanics or design, it manages to coax impressive performance out of the Game Boy hardware. Unlike, say, Monster Truck, the racing action feels fast, with turns zooming up quickly and demanding quick reflexes. You can choose from two different car options, one with a powerful engine and one with a less powerful engine. The top speed engine isn't necessarily the best option here. It's much harder to keep under control, and it has a tendency to drift off the road on sharp turns. As in pole position, the road is lined with billboards that will cause you to spin out if you hit them, so using that beefy engine requires a delicate touch. The smaller engine allows you greater control and makes spinouts less likely, but you'll have a harder time pulling into that all-important first place ranking. All in all, it's totally fine. Not the greatest racer ever, and I actually find it less approachable, and therefore less fun, than Roadster. It is, however, a remarkable technical feat for Game Boy, not just for its brisk 3D visuals, but also for the wild pack-in device that it shipped with. Granted, the four-player adapter ended up going the way of most Nintendo add-on peripherals, which is to say it saw very little use beyond this game. But it sure was a neat addition that proved the Game Boy could keep up with the feature set of the competition. Not that I imagine Nintendo was sweating the Atari Lynx all that much. This was more like a coup de grace, a little flourish to say, Oh yeah, we can do that too in BD. Next on Game Boy Works, Blob's Got Gender? 